Welcome to episode two of Real Life, Real Gospel, sponsored by, again, St. Paul Lutheran Church and School here in Boca Raton, Florida, or I guess there in Boca Raton, Florida, if you're listening from somewhere. That's not Boca Raton, Florida. Am I bragging that I'm in Florida while you might be in whatever cold, wintry place you're in? I might be, just a little bit. This week, uh, in case this is your first time listening in, this is a show that takes real life, everyday issues, and then applies the Bible, applies the gospel, applies, um, I guess, <coughs> just Christian reality to those daily li- to those daily life problems and issues. Um, our first episode, we talked about media and how Christians can and should interact with media at different levels. So this week we are discussing conflict and how Christians should handle conflict. This was a topic suggested in in one form by Travis Henry on Facebook. And the reason that I say in one form is because he submitted it as how do you deal with lazy coworkers? And while that is a great topic, um, I don't know if I could make an entire podcast out of it. So I decided to broaden it a little bit to ask, how do Christians deal with everyday conflict? Putting, I guess, more qualifiers on what I am talking about here. I am talking about in the case of a genuine sin, of a, I guess, a real reason for conflict, not uh, that you don't like someone's haircut or something, uh, but something that, like, there's an actual reason for the conflict, and we'll get into more what I mean by that as we continue. As we go forward, though, feel free to submit topics. That is how this show is driven. That's how I decide what episodes to do. Submit topics, whether that be in the comments on whatever platform you are listening to this. We are on Spotify. We are getting on iTunes soon. We're going to be on YouTube, and of course, we're on Podbean. So, with all of that, we have all these opportunities to listen, or you can message me on Facebook or email me at vicar at com. So, that is our introduction. That is getting us in. Disclaimers before I start. I put qualifiers on the topic. Now I'm putting disclaimers on this podcast. First of all, I am going to talk about not taking problems to the internet. I realize that this could be viewed as hypocritical. I want to clarify, as I approach this topic of conflict, I am not addressing anyone specifically. This is not meant to call someone specific out. If you feel convicted by this, good. Listen to it. Address your issues accordingly. But this is not directed at anyone specifically. I am not airing my conflict with someone about conflict on the internet. So, that is my disclaimer about that. Also, if you have a issue with this being, I guess, directed at you, maybe there's something we need to look at besides the fact that I shouldn't be doing a podcast on Christians and conflict. So, moving forward, as as we always do on Real Life, Real Gospel, I want to look at this through scripture and let scripture be our guide going forward. And the first scripture lesson that I have for us comes from Leviticus 19, but also verses from Proverbs. We have in Leviticus, we're told, you shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor lest you incur sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. And then from Proverbs 15, we have, A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And Proverbs 12 tells us that there is one whose rash words are like sword thrust, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Going through this verse, kind of dissecting this verse a little bit, in Leviticus we have, 
you shall not go around as a slanderer among your people. Um, this is speaking about speaking publicly against your neighbor. And there's this idea out there. I, I don't know who it came from, but I'm not a huge fan of it. Where people say, if it's public sin, it requires public rebuke or public correction. And frankly, I think that's a bunch of crap. Like, it, it, there's definitely not a biblical basis for it, at least that I found in my research for this show. If someone has sinned against you, and we're going to go through this over and over again, you go to them. You don't go to the internet. You don't proclaim it on the street corners. You go to that person. And if that person has committed a public sin, they're going to have a lot of people going to them, but it's not just one person going off publicly. I hope that makes sense. But going forward, just some examples of this. A lazy coworker might be considered a public sin because it's it's not necessarily just you as their coworker. They're influencing any business that that establishment does. They're influencing other... That's a public sin that they're doing out and it's affecting a lot of people. Um, but you don't then just go and, and like label them a lazy coworker, uh, put a big sign out in front of their office and try and shame them. You approach them individually. If someone has offended you publicly, someone called you a name in a public space and a bunch of people heard it, you still go to them one-on-one. -on -one. You're, not, you're not trying to slander people. You're not trying to bring them down because, as, as this concludes, you shall love your neighbor. And the final kind of example that I want to pull out for this is if someone is doing something wrong in a leadership role, in a pastoral position, in a political position, in whatever the case may be, again, the public sector isn't the place to try and te to rebuke them. We're, we're called here, you're not a slanderer. Don't stand up against the life of your neighbor. You shall not hate your neighbor in your heart. Reason frankly with them. Speak to them. Reason with them. Um, don't go through a third party. Don't go, and I'm including things like social media in the third party category. So we have all of this. Continuing through, it says, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. And I think the reason that this is included here is it's we're being encouraged to talk to our neighbor, to get explanation and explain the situation, the reality. And we're going to look at later even more. We're called to put the best construction on our neighbor's actions. So this is countercultural because in, in our society, we love this. We almost are addicted to this idea of righteous anger and of kind of getting justice for ourselves. And if we go to our neighbor and they explain that it was a simple mistake and there was no malice, that takes the wind out of our sails. And what I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters, today is let the wind be taken out of your sails. If, you, if a brother has sinned against you, if you have reason for conflict with a brother or sister and you go to them and it turns out it was a simple misunderstanding... I think that's a reason for celebration. You have won your brother. You you have resolved that conflict. And that's what we're talking about here. You don't do that by being aggressive toward them publicly. You do that by reasoning frankly with them on a individual level. Um, and not hating them, building up love for them, which is where this Leviticus passage continues. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. And for this, I'm, I'm simply going to ask, if you have done something, especially if it's accidental, to create conflict with someone else, do you want that brought out in front of everyone? And I'm presuming that your answer to that is no. No, you don't. Do you want people to assume malice when none was intended? If I, if I forget to do something for a coworker, I don't want them to assume that I am trying to undermine them and bring them down. 
I want them to assume that I just forgot to do something and I would love for them to come to me and remind me to do whatever I had to do because I don't have that malice. And I think there's a popular axiom. I don't know who it comes from that said never um, attribute malice to something that could be stupidity or something along those lines. And I, I think that's fair here. Don't attribute something to malice when it could be forgetfulness, when it could just be something slipped through the cracks, when there could be any other explanation, put the best construction on it. And that's my deconstruction of these Old Testament passages on conflict resolution. So the real life, real gospel take from this is the real life reality is conflict exists and things happen in our daily lives that create conflict justifiably so and the reality is often we feel like we need to get justice for ourselves and we feel like we need to speak the truth of how we have been wronged and we like to do that as publicly as possible to build up support but what i'm calling you to do is seek above that to preserve the relationship to speak a soft word. The tongue of the wise brings healing. In your conflict, seek to bring healing to that relationship, not just justice for yourself. Earlier, I talked about speaking the truth. The other part, speak the truth in love. And love doesn't speak the truth to everybody. Love speaks the truth of that conflict to the other person who is involved with that. And that's the real life, real gospel take from our Old Testament lesson, which segues us perfectly into, a, into the gospel that I want to look at today. And this, this passage it is near and dear to my heart. It is a favorite passage of mine. And part of that is because um, when I was in high school, I, I went through a situation where someone had a conflict with me. And I'll, I'll admit it was a justifiable conflict. I was a punk in high school. They, they had every right to come after me, but they brought it to social media instead of coming to me. And that did a lot more damage than if they had come to me because I would have apologized because I was in the wrong. And I would have, I would have done what needed to be done to resolve that conflict. At least I pray that I would have. But the conflict got bigger and bigger than it needed to be because it was on social media instead of just one-on-one -on -one. and this passage speaks to that Matthew 18 15 says if your brother sins against you go and tell him his fault between you and him alone if he listens to you you have gained your brother but if he does not listen take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I want to start going through, we, if your brother sins against you, that's how this starts. Sin, and here's where I want to get back to that disclaimer I had at the beginning of the podcast. I want to compare sin to wounded pride or difference of opinion. We have some examples of this. We have some examples of this sin versus wounded pride or difference of opinion. So one example, sin might be someone who refuses to do their work. They are called into a vocation and they are not doing their job. On the other hand, they might do their work in a different way than you would. Or they have different priorities in what they get done first or second or third than you do. And that could be a difference of opinion instead of sin. Someone came after you on social media and was slandering you on social media. That is a sin. We just talked about how you're not supposed to go publicly and slander. You're not supposed to be a slanderer. On the other hand, if someone liked a post that you disagree with, I wouldn't say that's a sin. I'd say that's a difference of opinion. Now, another another example, the church example that I have is 
If someone is teaching incorrect things in the church, that is a sin. If there is a pastor or a leader in the church who is doing and teaching things they shouldn't, that is sinful. This example might set some people off, but a difference of opinion would be someone leading worship with songs or a style you don't like. That is not a sin. That is a difference of opinion. I want to be crystal clear on that. So we have these examples. We're talking about a brother sinning against you. So continuing forward, it says, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Okay. Between you and him alone, this accomplishes a few things. The first is it minimizes the damage. If I have a conflict with my brother, let's call him John. Not any John specifically. This is generic name pulled out of a hat. If I go to him and we reconcile that conflict, that is one relationship that had to be repaired. If I go and tell Tyler and Evan and Amanda about my problem with John, that is now four relationships that have been injured by this that then have to be repaired. So if you start by just going to your brother, you're minimizing the damage of the conflict. And a lot of times this will straighten the situation out right away. You'll go to your brother, you'll talk about the conflict and they will, they'll say, Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to do that. It slipped through the cracks or I didn't mean it offensively. I, I meant it in this way. The situation gets explained and the conflict stops there because the goal here isn't to feel righteous anger. It isn't to get justice for ourselves. The goal is to gain your brother. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. In all, and this is a takeaway, you can put this on a plaque somewhere. In all conflict resolution, the goal is to gain your brother. And again, this, this verse, it says, Go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. Public sin does not merit public rebuke. If someone has sinned against you, you go to them. If they have sinned against a lot of people, each individual who has been sinned against should go to them. Understand? Like, I I can't be, in, in our world, I can't be clear enough on this. If you have a conflict with someone, you shouldn't put it on social media. You shouldn't put it in a blog. You shouldn't put it in an article. You shouldn't put it on the news. You should talk to them. That is what the scriptures are telling us. It does go forward though. It says, if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence or two or three witnesses. This is to ensure that conflict is being discussed and, and worked through fairly to verify that you aren't off base. So if I have a conflict with John, talked with him one-on-one, it didn't work out, I bring along Tyler and Amanda to talk with John, Tyler and Amanda might very well listen to that and say, Josh, you're the one who's off base here, okay? You're not just bringing people along to kind of gang up on the person you have conflict with. And again, the goal here is to win your brother over. Continuing forward, it says, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So when it says, tell it to the church, this is more of the same. It's building up so that this person knows what is going on and knows that it's not just you, that the reality is there is conflict that needs to be resolved. And all of this is assuming You already tried to resolve it individually and then with one or two, with two or three witnesses. And then finally, it does say, if he refuses to listen to the church, you treat them as a Gentile or as a tax collector. But my question for you today is, how did Jesus treat Gentiles and tax collectors? He loved them. He ate with them. He forgave them them. All of this is done to win your brother. And all of this should be done out of love 
for your brother. In the midst of your conflict, love your brother. So the real life, real gospel takeaway from this, the real life is sometimes people are difficult. Sometimes people are obtuse. So we will have to bring other people into the reconciliation process. But at the same time, sometimes we feel like we deserve justice or we deserve anger. And the problem for us then with this conflict resolution is that if we go to them one-on-one, the conflict might get resolved. It might have been a misunderstanding. And then we have no reason to be angry. We have no reason to seek justice. And we don't we don't want that. So the, the reality is so, sometimes people are difficult. Sometimes we are difficult. Because we, we feel we ought to be punished or we ought to punish in some way. But the real gospel of Matthew 18 is all of this seeks reconciliation all of this seeks to heal and build relationships and fellowship do this to gain your brother and with that we're talking about fellowship we're talking about building relationships and building up the body of christ so i want to go to first corinthians which is a book where paul is consistently instructing the corinthian church here's how you be church here's how you build one another up and first corinthians 6 says When one of you has a grievance against another, does he dare go to law before the unrighteous instead of the saints? Or do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world is to be judged by you, are you incompetent to try trivial cases? So do you not know that we are to judge angels? How much more than matters pertaining to this life? So if you have such cases, why do you lay them before those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is no one among you wise enough to dis- to settle a dispute between brothers? But a brother goes to the law against the brother and that before unbelievers? To have lawsuits at all with one another is al- already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. It's a big chunk of text. I'm aware of that. I know that. So I want to hone in our focus to two sections. The first is to have lawsuits at all with one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? And then the conclusion, he talks about all these sinful lives and he says, and such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. So the the points that I want to pull out of this passage for us as we look at Christians and conflict resolution is rather suffer wrong and be defrauded than tear down a relationship with your brother. So when we, we get in these conflicts and we feel like we're, we're justified and we're going through this conflict resolution, keep in mind that, you know, sometimes it might be worth being defrauded, suffering the wrong to gain our brother. And that goes against every instinct we have to try and seek justice for ourselves, to try and cling to our anger. But sometimes you just got to let it go. And one example of this might be, just to kind of uh, demonstrate what I'm talking about is, say you have uh, a son or a niece or a nephew or you're hanging out with a friend's kid and you're playing a game, like a video game together and you're taking turns and the little kid has a turn 
and they forget that they've already had their turn there. Say there are four people in the circle and they go first and then the next person goes and then they, they go again. At some point it's worth just letting them go again and waiting a little bit longer for your turn than there is to fight the toddler on. No, you have to wait till everyone else goes. And I know um, eventually you might want to teach them that lesson that you wait for everyone, but there are points where it's, it's worth suffering the wrong to be at peace with your brother. So you settle disputes as instructed. You don't go to the law. And in this, I think it's fair to include the court of public opinion. You don't go to the law. You don't go to the social media. You don't go everywhere, far and wide. You go through the process we just talked about out of Matthew 18. And what I get out of this 1 Corinthians passage and what I want to share with you is the priority for Christian conflict resolution are relationships with one another and the gospel. So as we go forward with our conflict resolution, the priority is, is gaining your brother, is building that relationship and the gospel. Not getting justice for ourselves not being satisfied that we were in the right. The priority is gaining our brothers and sisters. So the real life, the real life takeaway from 1 Corinthians 6 is that we do get into conflict. We have disagreements, even with brothers and sisters in Christ. Some are justified, some are not. And we want to be righted. We want to be paid. That's the real life reality of conflict in this world, especially in this culture. But the real gospel out of this situation is we should rather suffer wrong because Christ suffered wrong for us. And we have been forgiven. We have been washed. We have been sanctified. So we are now called to forgive others. Even if it means we are suffering wrong, we are defrauded, we are called to forgiveness. We're called to live like Christ. So summary and closing on this second episode of Real Life, Real Gospel, where we're talking about Christians and conflict is, conflict does happen, and sometimes it needs to happen. We need to be ready to address things. We're not called to ignore things that are wrong. We are called to speak to the tr- speak the truth, but we're called to go to our brothers and speak wise words. We're not called to avoid conflict. We're not called to ignore problems. We're not called to be quiet about things. We're called to go to our brother and speak wise words about them. But we do it the right way. We don't go around them to other people. We don't go around them to people we think are above them. We don't go to social media. We don't go over them. We go to them directly. And again, I want to take this opportunity to remind us that public sin doesn't merit public rebuke. So if you listen to this podcast and you're not convinced of this yet, listen to it again because it's in there. So in closing, the real life is we live in a world of conflict and we shouldn't flee from it. But the real gospel is we are called into loving, long-suffering relationships with one another. Go in peace. Serve the Lord, brothers and sisters.